guys, welcome back to a new episode of Ride Along. Today we are in Nairobi, Kenya to meet Sheila Charisema, co-founder of NIS Capital, a boutique investment banking and advisory firm providing services to small and medium-sized enterprises across the East African community. Today I want us to learn what it took for young Africans to change the narrative of funding for enterprises across East Africa and Africa at large. So come along. Hi guys, welcome to a new episode of Ride Along. Today I have with me a friend of mine called Sheila. And Sheila, you're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> and today I invited Sheila here because um, she's one of the young people who are doing some amazing stuff as a company founder and whatever. <laughs> Do you want to introduce yourself? Anything you want to say about yourself? Sure. So my name is Sheila Charisema. Um, I'm one of the co-founders of Nest Capital. We are a boutique financial advisory and investment bank. Essentially what we do is we work with small and medium enterprises to raise capital. This is across equity, debt, all kinds of structures. Um, we essentially are working across East Africa. So our main headquarters is in Nairobi, Kenya, but we service clients in Kenya, Uganda, Rwanda, and Tanzania. And um, we've evolved sort of part of our business model. We serve sort of early stage um, tech clients as a small percentage, but we evolved from that and now we're serving a lot of, you know, clients across all kinds of sectors. So this is manufacturing, real estate, healthcare, um, you name it. So yeah, that's, that's a bit about me, my background. I have studied engineering and also an MBA and an MPA. Okay, let's start with that. Like you did your undergrad in engineering. Yes. Why? Why did you choose engineering? Uh -huh. So I guess growing up in Uganda, you sort of get told if you're good at math and science, you have to be one of two things. That's a doctor or engineer. And given that I was quite queasy about blood, I figured engineering was, was the math, was the path for me. Uh -huh. um, but essentially, at the time, I remember when I went to the States for my university, I, you know, a part of it was just being mesmerized by the infrastructure that the country has been able to build. And so particularly when I was thinking about which engineering I would do, I think civil engineering made a lot of sense because I thought that this is something, you know, I'd like to, to go back home, move back, build similar infrastructure. Um, it was really fascinating it, and very eye-opening, actually, to see what has been done in other countries. And you always wonder, why is it that this has actually not been done before in my own country? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so what changed from engineering to what you're doing? Uh -huh. So my first summer internship, so I went to Brown University in Rhode Island, Providence, Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. And my first summer internship, I worked for an engineering firm in my second year. And I would spend my time cutting apart pieces of animals that I thought was very inexciting. Um, and most of the time I spent it a lot alone, which is something that's very common to the engineering field. You know, there's a lot of work you, you do by yourself and there's less appreciation of sort of working together, team environment. So I didn't quite um, enjoy that as much. And so for my second internship, I looked a little bit further so we had uh, recruitment across financial services, particularly, you know, there's a belief that if you're good in math, you can pick up anything in finance. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, I got recruited into an investment bank, Goldman Sachs in New York, and I enjoyed my experience there. I got an offer to go back full time. So I thought, hmm, why not? This is something I should try. And so when I did actually go back, I figured that, you know, I enjoyed my time and it kind of opened the door for me to thinking about broadly working in business and finance and also working in the policy space um, because I thought these are two fields where you interact with people, you can still be quantitative and build something. Even though I was not building bridges, I was hoping to build teams that can do lots of amazing work. Yeah. And then you went back to be a master's. Is that why you went back to be a master's? Yeah, so essentially at the time I figured 
you know, it's good to to want to get into finance um, and policy, but it would be great to have sort of the academic backing for it. So when I was looking, when I was considering my master's program, obviously engineering was out at that point, but um, you know, uh, so an MBA, a joint master's in business administration and, and a master's in public administration seemed like a perfect fit because I would be able to kind of get the principle-based grounding for the type of work I was, I was hoping to do. Mm. Okay, so fast forward, you finish your master's. What year was that? So I just finished in May 2017. So, so it was which, a three-year program. Which year did you start NISC? So we started, it's funny that we started in August of 2015. So I was actually in school at the time. I was doing my master's program at the time. And the whole idea, you know, my role particularly at that point, given that I was in the U.S., was to sort of secure some partnerships for us, particularly with U.S.-based investors looking at Africa, interested in the region. Because a lot of what you hear in the market is, I have very exciting projects, but no one to finance them. And on the flip side, you know, in sort of the financing investment world, you hear a lot of people thinking, you know, I would love to consider Africa, I just don't get good projects. So it was clear there's a mismatch around, at least per perception mismatch, whether in reality that mismatch was there, was yet to be um, confirmed. And so at the time, um, well, two other partners in NISC, Irene and Sarah, were on the ground here, one in Kenya, one in Rwanda, like sort of sourcing clients, just thinking about what business model would work for us, um, you know, because a, a part of what we're doing earlier on was was investing. Mm -hmm. So investing versus advisory. I was basically thinking about who, which partnerships would make sense. Are there some investors we could work with to raise a fund purely focused on Africa? Mm -hmm. So, so yeah. So during that period, while I was in school, I was also spending some time on NISC. Obviously, <laughs> my two partners were spending a lot more time, given they were working on it full time. Yeah. Why Kenya? Um, why did you choose Kenya to set up office though you work elsewhere? Like why Kenya was your... So we actually uh, also have an office pass. in Kigali. Okay. And they were kind of simultaneous because at the beginning when it was just two people, Irene was seated in Nairobi, Sarah was seated in Kigali. Um, but there was two things. Kigali was a market um, one of the partners knew really well. Mm -hmm. And also a market where you actually needed to be physically present um, just to walk with the clients through the, the type of product and service you'd be giving them and also um, what the expectation would be from the side of the investors or lenders. Mm. Now, why um, Nairobi? Nairobi makes sense from the financing side. So it's the center for all things financing. So if you are, you know, if you're in the financial services world, for East Africa particularly, a lot of shops set up here first. Um, it's just given the size of the economy and the positioning that the country has in terms of a skill force mm -hmm. and comes of, in terms of their own projection vis-a-vis -vis some of the other countries. So we thought it actually made sense for us to have a presence here, um, particularly to connect on the lending side. Because again, if you think about kind of what we do, we're bringing capital together with people mm -hmm. and on both ends of it, you know, you have the people looking for the capital and the people with capital. So on one side, it's finding the clients, but on the other side, it's also finding the investors. How has it been since you started, like in terms of growth and in terms of opportunities you found here in East Africa since you started? So it's been, it's been a, the beginning was quite a whirlwind to be quite honest. Obviously when you, a lot of the, a lot of what happens in our business is that you need, reputation is everything. Mm -hmm. And, um, Having a network is everything. Now, when you start out without a reputation, without having fundraise for a single person, it's um, it can be challenging to kind of get people to trust you and to get people to sign you on. Mm -hmm. um, so where we started from in 2015, that we've had, you know, the, there's been a lot of growing pains in certain in certain areas, in just like thinking about our business model and thinking about who we finance, how we do it, which partnerships we create. 
but also i mean you can see the opportunity you know you can see the world of opportunity there's a lot of good businesses here that are truly capital constrained and also just the cost of capital in the market is much higher so if you're able to source somewhat cheaper financing if you're able to source better structures mm. the thing is what does get around so after our first few deals basically we've grown from people referring other clients to us which is like the best way to go it's a vote of confidence um and so we've been we've been pretty happy about how that has been going so far mm-hmm. um of course there were some challenges along the way we've had some you know there's sometimes you work with investors that turn out not to be who you think they are uh, or turn out not to be legitimate i think managing client expectations and ensuring that you're on the same page in terms of what what they need what you're getting is also very important um and so you know it's been it's been quite a journey for us but i would mm-hmm. say that everything that we've learned from the first time we we'll just keep iterating and improving on it okay uh before you go i just wanted to ask like on a personal note what are your kind of personal goals moving forward because um you went to did your masters you started in the career you want to do but what is what are the future hold for you so personally um so i'm thinking about right now i'm thinking about things in sort of five year time frames i guess i think there's still a lot of work to be done at nest in terms of opportunities um i would really like i think some of the structures that we've been able to do most recently are actually structures that had not yet been done in this market there are structures that exist in other markets but have not been done from a financing perspective in this market mm-hmm. and so we've actually been thinking about ourselves as sort of um market creators in some way market shapers just being really innovative about the solutions the financing solutions that we can give our clients mm-hmm. and so from that perspective I'd really like to grow in that space within the finance space in East Africa to continue to do that for some time I am also quite keen on being an operator at some stage <laughs> so it's an operator you know actually running a company because basically what I spend most of my day doing mm. is looking at all kinds of businesses mm. identifying strengths weaknesses growth areas and then figuring out how to finance them looking at their numbers mm. so it gives you an interesting breadth of you know what you can what you can potentially do um in terms of actually running your own company yes. because at the end of the day as an advisor I give advice <laughs> our hope is that the client takes the advice which most cases they've been doing but when they don't we're stuck with our own advice right so sometimes mm-hmm. you do see a business and you're like they will be really good to run that business mm-hmm. you get experience advising across businesses because you see best practices in different um in different areas and you you just think about how you could also do it um so i think at some point i'd want to transition from sort of this advisory role to an operator role mm. um in the so that's sort of my short to medium term goals i think my long term goals i'm very interested in policy i started it for a reason i think there's a lot you can do when you work in the public realm mm. and i hope to transition to an organization that has sort of um whose impact is much more or like far a national reaching. or regional scale yeah so maybe something national maybe something regional maybe global. something global yeah um but whose mandate is is quite broad and more also in the policy space so i do think about you know at some point transitioning into a career in 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 policy um and so we'll see we'll see how that pans out <laughs> what advice would you give to someone who's watching and either is in your similar field or is just what it takes to kind of to have this idea to start your own company push for it i don't know what kind of advice would you give such a person so i think i would tell them i mean it takes a lot of grit there's some really really hard days um you know at some point we just had a really disappointing experience with one of our prospective investors that was either going to make or break nisk yeah. and those are the kinds of experiences you have to think about 
how well have I grown my company? How well can I continue to grow it to withstand them? Mm. And so, I mean, being aligned on vision is super important with whoever you're doing it with because you spend a lot of time when you're doing your own company. It's not a nine to five job. You spend several hours outside of that time frame building it and nurturing it. Um, thinking about talent for us, like our talent is key. I mean, really our business, intellectual property is is very much um, sort of our talent and what, what we are able to do, what we're able to structure. And so recruitment has been very close to my heart, getting a team that I'm confident um, can perform the task at hand, that I'm confident I can go into a role, that has been, it's been a challenge in the market, but it's not been impossible. And so it's something that I've had to think a lot about. So that's something I think people, you know, sometimes people overlook HR, mm. uh, but I think it's extremely important. And it's something you need to really think about who you're building around you because the other ones can take your company forward. Mm. And um, so in the beginning, I think you just have to think about how much grit you have to push whatever idea you have to do. And then I think as the company grows, you need to think about how you let go of some responsibilities, allow other people to take them on, and how you're not changing them to also take your company to the next level. Okay. Um, what would you say, uh, I don't know, people, or if you have mentors, who you look up to and why? Ah, just one person. It can be someone you know personally or someone you don't know, but you have followed their career and you kind of adore them or something. Oh, um, I don't know if I can... Uh, there are many. Yeah. It's tough to narrow it down to a person, but I think I can talk about sort of qualities I, I aspire to and I admire. I mean, I've seen people recreate themselves in m- multiple careers. So the idea that actually, you know, if, if you have a certain set of skills... Mm. You can use those skills to do, you know, besides obviously if you haven't studied medicine, don't go cutting up people. But, you know, <laughs> but is there no in particular who you've seen do that? And uh, like, that was. So I guess, so business school like, exposes us to a lot of entrepreneurs. I would say anyone, like we, we kind of looked at companies all the way from, you know, giant companies like the Microsofts of this world or the Facebooks of this world and how they created them. And obviously the personalities behind those are extremely powerful. Um, I mean, I've been inspired by female leaders in business. Um, I mean, I look at like Indra Noi with her, you know, what she did with Pepsi as a colored woman rising to an American corporation of a Fortune 500 company, um, or Sheryl Sandberg. I mean, so there's a lot of figures you study. And so for me, it becomes tough to think about a name per se, career-wise particularly. Um, but then there's also, like, when I think about sort of just the general trajectory of, of the career I'm aspiring to, but then I also think about um, sort of just people who have lived their, their lives with, with vision or mission. And I think most, you know, most recently for me coming, coming out of the States, obviously the Obamas were some, you know, were people you aspire to because they have done incredibly well for themselves, but they've also like just managed to live their life with with a mission. Yeah. So I, I guess I mean I still have not answered your question with one person, but I think yeah. it's because I don't look up to what? any one person and say like this is whose path I want to follow. I think yeah. I get I draw inspiration from, from more than one person. Yeah. From lots of different careers, different paths. Okay. Uh, Thank you so much for joining us on this episode of Ride Along. I hope you have learned something. I hope uh, you have picked something from this interview. Uh, Leave a comment in the comment section, uh, questions you'd have for us, uh, for me, and for Sheila as well. I will put her details of NISC (laughs) in the comments in the the description. So thank you for watching. Bye. Thanks. Bye-bye.